Watts, each of have stuff to Jerry Watt when we get today. He has an extraordinary background. His book is outside How to Deal. It's a great read, um, not only for parents, but it's a great read for teenagers. Um, he's a very popular, there it is, very popular speaker at school assemblies um, for teachers and parents. He's a clinical psychologist and adolescent specialist with a practice at Hogue Neuroscience Institute in Newport Beach. Um, How to Deal is really a survival guide for teens and it's being sold outside. He will also be signing it at the end. Um, there is also the sign-up sheet coming round. He has two new books coming out. One is on parenting and one is um, a book for, for younger, ch younger children, is it, or children in general on bullying. So if you would like to be on this email list, please add your name to this. I'm going to pass it around right now. Um, I know I'm very eager to hear about strategies that we can all um, use, so please help me in welcoming Dr. Jerry Wright. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for taking time out of your busy days to be here. I uh, hope I make it worthwhile for you. Um, in addition to the list of stuff that you just read, uh, I'm also a parent, so I heard that. I've been doing this for, this is my 15th year of specializing in adolescence and parenting adolescents. And, uh, for the first bunch of years, all the parents would look at me, that's all great stuff, but wait till you see when you're when you have kids, it's totally different. So I do have younger kids. Um, I've got a younger, I have a three-year-old daughter and a five-month-old boy, and about five, four, about 40 to 45 teenagers. So um, <laughs> I'm in the trenches with the parents and the family, so I'm just trying to take advantage of these next 10 years that I've got with my kids before everything switches, because every day and every hour I get a preview of what's coming, and even though this is what I do for a living, I know I'm not getting out of this unscathed like anybody else. So um, today we're going to talk about the state of teens today, we're going to talk about uh, behavioral parenting, you know, how do you parent a kid this age, because when they start hitting 11, 12, 13, 16, you know, you really just can't put them in a 16 minute timeout. it's just completely <laughs> so, We're also going to talk about substance abuse, we're going to talk about, you know, how to increase communication with your son or your daughter, uh, we're going to talk about, you know, latest trends of bullying and what you can do as a parent to help inundate and, and inoculate your kids for what's out there and what's coming. Um, we're also going to talk about the electronics, you know, the smartphones, the Xbox, PS3s. If you're a parent of an adolescent right now and your kids like the game, you're all about Call of Duty, Black Ops, and Halo 4, and FIFA Soccer, and all these things that are hot. So, um, before we get started, I'd like to get a poll. How many people have uh, elementary school kids? What about middle schoolers? And high schoolers? <laughs> Perfect. We've got a good mix here. I like the uh, elementary school parents because you guys are being proactive because a lot of stuff we're talking about will inevitably come across your radar in some shape way or form down the line. Um, okay, so what's going on with teens today? Well, you know, today's kids, they really feel inadequate and insecure. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of increased distress, you know, depression, stress, anxiety for them that I'm seeing over the last couple of years. Um, you know, they don't know who they are, where they're going, what they're going to become. They live, no matter if your kid's at a private school or a, or a public school, they live in a world where they're not seen for who they are nor who they will be. It's a very clicky, judge a book by its cover world. And I really think that about 5% of the kids are really in the, living the life, so to speak. You know, they live in this world that's so much different than ours, where it's really truly about presentation. Um, all the kids at school are putting up a fake front like they've got it all together and everything's, and everything's perfect. Um, and inev inevitably, all the kids are struggling in some shape, <coughs> whether it's with their body, their parents, college stress, social drama, I mean, you name it, everybody struggles. But nobody talks about it very rarely except for the people that are close to them, so the kids are walking around school going, everybody's living a life, but something must be really wrong with me. Um, I think that you know 5% of the kids are really in the in crowd. The other 95 are wanting to be part of the in crowd and almost a caste system exists no matter what school your kid's at where a lot of times no matter what they change differently, what they do differently to try to get up into that upper echelon of that group, 
they don't get access, which just compounds that helplessness, hopelessness, feelings of inferiority. Um, on top of that, you know, we've got the kids that are measuring their self-worth by peer acceptance. It's what I call social stock. So somewhere along the line, there's a switch where on the hierarchy, where friends become family, and family take the place of friends, and the friends are the utmost importance. And how you're received and perceived by your peers is of the utmost importance to them. Um, we've got teasing and, and bullying that's rampant on Facebook, Instagram, at school, and it's really starting to morph with all the new anti-bully stuff that's coming in. They're still learning how to acclimate to that and adapt to that and still do a lot of the stuff that they were doing previously. Uh, you've got substance abuse, which is rampant in our community. It's everywhere from, I see kids all the way past Dana Point, all the way up past Long Beach, and all the public and private schools in between. And substance abuse is a huge, huge problem. Um, I, I tell parents, everybody takes a, gets a little bit gasped when I say this, but I'm routinely seeing kids starting to experiment with drugs and alcohol in 7th and 8th grade. And I can't tell you, doing this for so long, how many highly educated, highly invested parents were sitting in my office going, uh, we had no idea this was going on. And, and it only came across the radar when it was a serious problem. So the attitude is different nowadays. They're extremely rude to adults. So, I mean, I, all the parents that come in go, you know, if I did anything half the time, what my kids do, my dad would have knocked me out. <laughs> We've got, you know, increased academic pressure and stress. It is truly harder to get into colleges. I've got a lot of kids who are putting self-imposed pressure on them. We've got helicopter moms, tiger moms. I mean, you name it. There's a lot more stress. <laughs> um, so you combine all this stuff with, you know, drama with, you know, problems with siblings or boyfriends or girlfriends, and you've got a truly toxic mix. And the kids don't know how to handle it. They don't have the tools to deal with it. And on top of that, they either flip in or they flip out. You know, they flip out when they're exploding, they've got this short temper, they're slamming the doors, they're punching the walls. Uh, another, op another internal option we'll talk about, which is psychosomatic stuff, is they've got recurring headaches, back aches, stomach aches. When they're flipping in, they hold this stuff. I get a lot of referrals for that through the hospital and through people in the community. Um, or you turn into self-mutilation when they flip in. So, Long and short is we're going to have to come up with some new ways to handle them and what's going on. And I think hopefully by coming here today, there's going to be a lot that you're going to be able to take out of tonight. Um, so your kids right now, depending on the age, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, around 11 to 14, 15, if you're lucky as a parent, you see a gradual or overnight shift with your kids. They go from wanting to please you, wanting to stay out of trouble, stay in your good graces, to starting to think that you're annoying, or that they're embarrassed by you, or that you stink so bad you have to drop them off two blocks down the street, because they cannot in the world be seen for you with you around their friends. They don't want to be seen in public, so it makes it a lot more difficult for family outings to get them to go to church or to temple or just to dinner as a family. Uh, it's completely embarrassing for them. <laughs> So you're going to see this switch. All of a sudden, they don't want to do chores. All of a sudden, they don't really want to do homework. They don't want to do the small day-to-day -day stuff that you think as an adult or a parent is so easy and simplistic for them to do. Um, I see a lot of parents that are either intimidated by their kids as they start approaching this age, where they start raising up and they really don't like the intensity of that, so they back off a little bit. I see the, the biggest pitfall I see with parents is they will take the short, life is already chaotic enough as a parent, you know, especially if you're working or you're running, running a household and you're getting kids from one place to another, it's chaotic at this stage in the game. And I see a lot of parents that are willing to take the short term gain of not having to hold their kid accountable. They don't want to create more waves, they've already got enough in their life, but that turns out to be the long term consequence of their kids, you know, running amok and this thing perpetually getting worse. So what we're going to talk about today a little bit is about how to take that short-term consequence of holding your kid accountable for the long-term gain of getting things under control, you feel more empowered as a parent, and your home being more peaceful overall. So, um, first of all, it's a lot, it's really frustrating as you start getting, as they start getting older. Um, I think for a parent, it's really not so much the ultimate challenge as a parent I've found thus far, 
it's not about can you control your kids, it's about can you control yourself through this crazy process. <laughs> so let's talk about how to control yourself, especially as your kids start hitting that stage. Although they're bigger, they're smarter, they're wittier, they might be taller than you even when they're in middle school, they're still little kids. You know, there's so much more still those little kids inside than they are big adults. You've got to see them for who they really are. I mean, you, most of you know about brain development. You know, brain development continues into their mid-20s, and the last part of their brain to develop is their frontal lobe, which is responsible for logic and thought and impulse control and rationale. Um, so to some extent, you have a kid walking around with a partially developed brain. You have a special needs kid in your home. <laughs> You have to see them as such because they come into my office and you know because I'm younger and you know they expect to see first of all they come into my office and they get what I call mom bombs and like they don't even know they have an appointment they get them off and drop them off and they go there you go right so then I got to bring the kid down but it's kind of easier for me because I'm younger because what'll happen is they expect to see Mr. Rogers in a sweater vest and say hey dude what's going on or hey girl what's happening and it's a totally different deal right off the bat for them. <laughs> um, but with that information, you know, I can take a lot of things and keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening, what's changing, you know, how to, and help parents on strategizing how do we combat the stuff that's changing. Um, but you got to see them for who they are. And a lot of the kids that come into my practice will tell me, they do stupid, stupid stuff, right? Doesn't make any sense. I don't care if your kid has an attention deficit disorder or not, they're going to make stupid, impulsive decisions just based off of the brain development problem itself. So they'll come into my office and they'll go, I don't know why I did it, they told me not to do it, I told myself not to do it, and I did it, I'm an idiot, right? <laughs> this is the stuff we're talking about. So you gotta see them who they are, because it's gonna make it a lot easier. I mean, if you truly did have a special needs kid in your home, I guarantee you, if you have an adolescent, you wouldn't be reacting to them the way that you have been in the past. On top of that, your job as a parent is to provide that stability for the rest of the family because everything that happens in a family system is like throwing a rock into a still pond, the ripples hit all the banks. So when you're completely losing your composure, or your teenager is, it has this ripple effect. It has an effect on the younger kids in the home. I mean, if you have a dog, even the dog tucks his tail and walks out the room. <laughs> so you've got to see them for who they are. Um, on top of that, I think you got to understand if you're not already in this and entrenched in this, it's going to take way more time and energy to parent these kids from 13 to 18 than it has their entire life. And that comes with a shock to a lot of the parents. You know, they sit there going, you know, when they were two and sticking their finger in light sockets and, you know, learning to walk and hitting their head on tables, we were all over them. We thought as they got older, we could just give them some a lot more freedom and, you know, they'd figure this out and we could start focusing on other stuff like ourselves or other kids. It's really not the case. I mean, you got smaller kids and bigger bodies that have, you know, have trouble dif making good decisions that are now getting into a world where they have freedom and the responsibility of driving a car and there's drugs and alcohol and there's a lot of peer influence. It's a crazy, crazy world. So, it's your job, number one, to be a parent not a friend, okay? Your kids have plenty of friends, and even if they don't, they need parents. When you get them into my office and you sift it all down, as much as they hate you and you're annoying for doing the stuff that you do, they like it. <coughs> the kids that don't have the parents that are holding them accountable really feel out of control. Because, I mean, think about it. You've been leading them your entire life, right? Their entire life. If you just start backing off or allowing them up to your level in the hierarchy, that's a crazy position for a kid to be in. They're not ready to be an adult, and they really don't want most of them to be an adult until they're 18 and ready to go to college. So helping them stay below you in the hierarchy actually does relieve a lot of stress and anxiety for the kids that are kept in that position. So you gotta understand, this is your, this is your world, okay? You own them in and out completely. It's your house. You pay for the car, I don't care if they got an iPad for a gift or they bought it with their own money, if it's under your roof, you own it. You've got to keep that in mind as a parent because they'll really try to do a lot to convince you otherwise. <laughs> so the big key right now is they're right in between being kids and adults. And if you've got a high schooler, your job is truly to get them ready for the real world. And in the real world, we're held accountable. 
I mean, you're late for work, enough times you get fired, you speed, you get tickets, you don't pay the IRS, they're coming to find you. We have tangible consequences as adults that we don't like, okay? The biggest gift you can give your high schoolers and middle schoolers as they start approaching young adolescents is bringing a similar concept into your home to help give them that inoculation they need to help get rid of their life. <coughs> similar to how you get a shot of the flu shot helps build your antibodies to you know the flu. If you can bring the real world mentality with accountability, but allowing them enough freedom to navigate it, it helps get them ready for what's coming. And the parents that don't do this are that have a lot of the kids that I see that have the failure to launch. They go out there and it gets tough, or they have to deal with an authoritative boss, and they quit, or they talk back to a cop, or they just jump job to job, or they can't handle school because it's just too much, or whatever it is. If you can bring this into your home now, they acclimate to it, and they have a much higher likelihood of going out there and hitting their, hitting their peak the way you know they can in their life. <coughs> so how do you go about doing this? Well, first of all, I think that the name of the game is you can talk to your blue in the face. You can lecture these kids. It's just air. It doesn't phase them. It's like water off a duck's back. And you got to understand, one of two things happens with this. If you're yelling, out of time, they get desensitized to it, so it doesn't really phase them. Or you yell, and then it starts fueling their fire, so they try to yell above you, and then you guys end up firing through the roof together, right? The lecturing, your kids have about a 30 second attention span for you driving home important information. That means everything after 30 seconds, 60 max, is he they're hearing wah 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 wah, wah right? So I'm going to teach you today how do you go about delivering all this in 60 or 30 or 60 seconds or less. Um, okay, so first of all, from the tangible side of things, I think number one, Parents make, uh, you've got to learn how to play pop. You've got to take the lecture and the, the yelling out of it. I mean, the name of the game is you are simply the police officer. And I hear so many parents, I just had one in my office yesterday. I don't want to police my kid. And I was going, well, you know, to be honest with you, there you don't have too much of a choice if you want to get things under control the way that you want them to be. So cops stay calm, they don't lecture, they give tickets, and they move on. They don't take them personally. No matter what you do, they don't just sit there and think about what you did all day, hold on to it, go to <laughs> You believe that they did this right when their husband or wife gets home, right? It's out of sight, out of mind, okay? And you really have to adopt a really similar mentality. So I think, you know, what we want to do with this is you're going to need a code word. We're going to talk about how do you actually go about doing this, but if you're co-parenting with somebody, it's really important you have a code word. That's one of you might be a yeller, one of you might be a lecturer, one of you might be a combination of both, but there's no tangible consequences. It's the tangible consequences that shape human behavior. Okay? If you've ever been pulled over by the police for a moving violation, they don't scream, they don't yell, it's the ticket. It's the ticket that shapes your behavior. You have a point on your record, you have to go to traffic school, you have to pay a fine, all from one commonly de delivered piece of paper. And that affects you so much that the next time you're in that general vicinity, your head's on a school <laughs> yeah. you right? If they lecture you and let you go, it doesn't have the same effect. I can tell you firsthand, I was just happy I got out of there without a ticket, right? If they yell at you, let you go, it doesn't have the same effect. So it's the tangibles. So before we get into tangibles, let's go into your code work. So if you're co-parenting with somebody, it's really important you remind your, your significant other, stay calm, don't lecture, don't yell, give the kid the ticket, let's move on. Um, wherever you live, if you're going to beach, anywhere else you came from this morning, I think it's important, I like what, LBPD, we're going to beach police department. Something you can say in front of the kids that goes, hey honey, calm down, don't yell, don't lecture, give the kid a ticket, let's move on. Okay, and if you can't do it, you can't compose yourself, get out of the way, take a break so I can do it, okay? Um, the issue with the, how do, we, how do we go about this? Well, a lot of parents make mistakes with the tangibles. You know, they'll take one thing, well, give me your cell phone. Well, okay, yeah, your cell phones are tethered to them like an umbilical cord if you ever try to take it from most of them. But it doesn't have the same effect, then there's still a lot of effect. 
they'll go and watch TV, or they'll go hang out with friends, or they will go on their iPod, their iPod Touch that you don't, a lot of you don't know has internet capability, and jump right back on <laughs> Instagram and post, my mom is so amazingly annoying, I hate my life, right? So, really it's a rule of thumb. Parents make one of two mistakes. They take one thing. What you want to do when your kids are off task is take absolutely everything. It's got to be a clean sweep, okay? That means cell phone, TV, computer, video games, going out with friends, okay? Now, I also get the parents that really try to drive this home, and what you guys got to understand, by grounding your kids for a month or two months or five months or whatever it is, <laughs> learning doesn't take place from one huge incident, especially with impulsive, partially developed brain, preteens and adolescents. Shape, learning takes place from a lot of successive trials and shaping their behavior. So as a rule of thumb, you take absolutely everything, but you take it for the rest of that day or for a 24-hour period. Now we're talking about just behavioral type stuff. I mean, if your kid comes home drunk and crashes the car through your garage, you're not going to go, you lost your car for tomorrow. <laughs> but we're talking about for the smaller stuff. Because what you don't, what I don't like about taking things months out is, first of all, if you put things weeks or months out for the most part, depending on the severity of the situation, for them, they can't see past the end of their nose at this age. So it starts to lose it, their effectiveness over time. They can't hang their hat on it, it's too far out there. So not only does it become less effective for them, but for you as a parent, you then lose your leverage to shape their behavior with every day thereafter. And your kids are smart, they'll get this over time. They'll go, well, you're going to for two months, what are you going to do? You want to go for three? Yeah, 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 let's go for three. You know, because they know I'm already in this, I don't care. I'd rather just prove a point that like, I really don't care, even though I do care, and try to get you upset in the process. Um, so you take everything, you take it for the rest of that day, if it's early in the day or afternoon, or for a 24-hour period, okay? Um, what we want to do on top of that is, what we want to do is, we've got the kids that are stirring it up, okay? And there's a lot of manipulation, there's a lot of dialogue, there's too much dialogue that I'm seeing, you know? What'll happen is the kids get good at manipulating. So you'll try to have that conversation, you know, First of all, in having that conversation, it's really easy. I know firsthand as a parent, your kids upset you and you escalate, right? And then a lot of times they'll escalate and then you fire through the roof. Or they'll escalate and you'll go up there to try to bring them back down if the same thing happens. What you want to do is really, number one, stay calm. As you get older, that amount of cortisol on a day-to-day -day basis can really take its toll on you physically. I mean, if you've got a genetic predisposition to a cancer from a grandparent, regular amounts of cortisol can actually bring that out in you. Number two, it's completely ineffective, let alone the high blood pressure and all the other stuff that goes with it. And it's just air to your kids anyways. So it's really got to be about action and not talk. But if they're the ones that ramp up, what I want you to do instead of your natural inclination to go up there and get them, I want you to drop the opposite direction to point and whisper. You say, hey, you know what I'm saying? He's got to do this before you do this. Okay, and what will happen is, They'll try to engage you to bring you back up. Why are you talking like that? You know, <laughs> okay. If you can stay down here, it's tough for 30 seconds, 60 seconds with them. Number one, at that point, it's a habit for them to have that quick fuse to escalate. They don't even realize it half the time they're doing it. Number two, it models for them they're being too loud. And it's really, really awkward to have a conversation. If someone's standing up here yelling and somebody's down here whispering, Someone's going to have to give ground to keep that dialogue going. So, they're also emotionally connected to you at this stage in the game, which means that your voice oftentimes can be pacifying for them and help calm them. Now, you get 30, 60 seconds into this and this isn't working, you've got to take a break. Okay? I don't care what they did, how hot anybody is, you have to take that break because you cannot have a rational conversation with an irrational person, regardless of who that is. And if you or they stay in that dynamic, all of a sudden, all this stuff comes out that shouldn't be said. You know, the stuff you wouldn't say to your kid normally that you feel guilty about. They lash out and say stuff that would really be hurtful, detrimental, and they feel bad later. Sometimes they don't. Um, but you got to take that break, okay? Now, when you take that break, you've got to let the dust settle. But you have to have a reapproachment. Because then, if you don't reapproach them later on, it might be 15 minutes, it might be the next day. But you gotta reapproach it and hash it out, because otherwise they realize that 
if they make their head spin around and green puke go everywhere, they get out of situations, okay? So here is how you say everything in 30 seconds or less if uh, you're re-approaching your kid. You come into their room. See, part of what's happening right now is as you get older, the majority, everybody's busy, it's a chaotic life. The majority of the parent-child interaction becomes predominantly neg negative. It's about what's not right, what hasn't been done, what still needs to be picked up or cleaned up in the kitchen, right? So over time, you get conditioning where they see you and they're already expecting you to be all over them. So a lot of times you go and open their door and they're like, what, what, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah they're already on the, they're already on the offense because they're expecting, what are you gonna rag on me about now? So here's what you do with this. You know, you, you'll go into the room, you start off with the positive because you don't want that condition effect between you talking them and negativity. So it goes something like this. Hey, you know what? I'm proud of a lot that you're doing right now but I'm not gonna tolerate you doing X, whatever it is, the same being rude and disrespectful. Then you pair that with the real, real world implications. They wanna know why all the time, right? Why, 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 why? Tell them the why. Help them to piece this together, okay? When you leave this home in a number of years, you go treat a boss, professor, anybody else like that, the consequences are gonna be way worse. So because of that, you're grounded for today, okay? You gotta also let them know how long they're grounded for because it can make your kids freak out in a not good way. I have parents who go, ah, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, you know, we don't know yet. Um, that's gonna drive your kid too crazy. I mean, imagine going to jail and they go, they look at you and I, we don't really know, we're gonna let you out, but we'll figure it out eventually. Okay? If you've got a set time you can prepare yourself for, you can oftentimes prep yourself for that to make it through that without losing your mind. So, you said these things to them. Now this is where the manipulation truly takes place. You made your poor statement, and now they're going to pop out on the side here and start chattering away. Well, that's not fair. Nobody else's parents do that. You don't do it with my brother or sister. I hate you guys. You're the worst parents in the world. La, 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 right? Now, if you go and engage that, that's a couple minutes your life will never get back again. <laughs> right? Because in their mind, if they can get you over here talking about this thing, they still got a chance to get out of it. So they're going to try to wing you all the way around and do a 180, which is, with, which is why you're more frustrated after that conversation than before you went into it. Okay, so here's how you avoid it. So you've just made your statement. They're going to pop out inside. That's not fair. Nobody else's parents do this. You guys are the worst parents in the world. I want you to go back and say exactly what you just said again. Proud of a lot you're doing. I'm not going to tell her you're treating me that way. Leave this house a number of years. This is what's going to happen. This is your consequence. I hate you. You're the worst parent. I'm proud of a lot you're doing. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you say that the most three times and you gracefully bow out of their room. Okay? Now, the kids will act out. They'll manipulate in other ways. Um, sometimes they'll manipulate by talking about suicide. I'm just going to kill myself, or I feel like I should just kill myself, or you guys make me want to kill myself. This is nothing that I'm at all a fan of. Um, I see there's a lot of teen suicide. It's a tough, they're impulsive, they do stupid stuff. A lot of these kids that commit suicide, if they waited the day, would have never killed themselves in the first place. So whenever you hear that, that's a huge red flag. And, uh, you know, because kids will hint two to three times statistically before they actually do attempt to kill themselves. So to me, if I'm a parent, and this is my kid, I'm not willing to roll the dice and pay the price on the one or 2% chance that my kid's actually thinking about doing this. Um, a lot of times this turns out to be just them, their immature way to communicate that they're truly unhappy. A lot of times they learn that this is a good way to shake you up and manipulate you so they can get more of what they're looking for or get a less of a sentence on the issue that was at hand or to completely get you off the track of what you were talking about. Either way, I recommend you take your kids straight to the emergency room. And if your teen's ever suicidal, where you want to take them to is, it's a little bit of a trek, but it's UC Irvine in orange, not Irvine. Okay, the adolescent ward at UC Irvine is, it's, it, there's an adolescent ward, number one, and number two, they're really good at what they do over there, and it's insurance-based. Long and short, you want to rule out the one to 2% chance your kid's ever going to do something. And if you can get up the cojones to get your kid in the car and get them over there, they go through the entire sit in the ER for four or five hours, they get blood drawn, they've got a social worker they talk to you, they've got a security guard standing next to them. They're going to assess that one to 2%, but it really serves a big message, which is you cannot talk like that in this home, period. You've got to find another way to talk. 
And any parent that I've done this with that's actually done this has come back and told me that it worked amazing. The kid never talked about it again. We'll talk about it. I know you're thinking in the back of your head, well, what if they truly are suicidal and we do this and they don't want to go to the hospital, but then they do something. We're going to talk about how to handle that later on. Um, okay, so the last part on the behavioral stuff is if your kid's running amok right now, it's because they don't know where the line is for you. Okay? That line for you is that <clears throat> feeling inside your stomach that you get. Okay? That's your line. But what happens is a lot of parents will not pay attention to that, and then they get crossing in the red zone, and they snap, and they start yelling and freaking out. Well, for your kid, that's where your line is, right? Because they're advantageous. They're going to push and push and push to see how far they can get things to go. To them, that communicates that's where your line is. But then, if you're not having tangible consequences, then it doesn't really phase them that much, so they'll keep pushing and look like they're completely out of control. So that line, and it might be different with if you're co-parenting with somebody, your guys' lines, that's okay. The deal is, is that line, that feeling, that's where you gotta communicate that they're approaching your line. The way you do that is you simply give them two choices, okay? You feel that feeling and go, hey, you got two choices. You do this and this happens, or you do this and this happens, you choose. You know, they're the ones behind the wheel, so we want to give them choices. We want to give them control. We want to give them the, hey, you're on my, you're approaching my line right now, you got a choice, and you got options, you choose, it's your, you're the one behind the wheel. So if they cross that line, then you're going for the day, right? Um, if they completely jump over your line, you know, if your, like, kid ever calls you moms, like, a bitch, you get that one, that's a completely, that's a, that's way over your line. You're not going to go... If you do that one more time, you know, okay, that can't happen. We're talking about for the smaller day-to-day -day type stuff. Um, okay, so on top of that, you're going to start, what we wanted, the whole name of the game is they start approaching this, and it's going to make your life less stressful, is really kind of enforcing boundaries. You know, we've got a lot of parents, it's understandable. You're all over your kids for all the, other thing, all the things that are going on, but that sense of micromanagement is just going to make them more oppositional and rebel. I got a lot of it's, it's. I got a lot of parents that you know. I, I liken it to the Utopia cards at Disneyland, where you got the parents that are you know it's, they're the one behind the wheel. You can't ultimately control their kid, right? Like all well, their kids are the behind the wheel, so they have to they have free will. They make choices that goes with or against you, but they're, they you can't ultimately control a kid. So I liken it to the Utopia cards at Disneyland. You know you can't just grab their steering wheel. Like all these parents, here comes a right turn, and they're pushing on their feet on the gas pedals. Like you got to slow down. As they start getting older, you want them to learn how to navigate life so they can go out there and function as well as possible. You really just need to set back and create the boundaries, okay? You're the tracks on the Utopia Cars at Disneyland where you just sit back, relax, and enforce the boundaries like a police officer with attitude, respect, grades, whatever, sit relations with siblings. And if they go too far one way or the other way, there's something to throw them back on the track. Um, now, you're not going to see changes right away most of the time. You start doing this and you're not doing this already. So I get some parents who come in, they've done this for a couple of times, they go, this doesn't work, it's not working. Your kids are going to not believe that you're going to follow through and stay consistent on something like this if you have been in the past. So it's going to take at least five to ten times, depending on how strong will your kid is, even 15 or 20 times of doing this before they realize this is consistent and this is what is going to happen from here on out. And that is when you see that shift and change in their behavior. It's what we call an extinction burst. You know, they're going to act out, act out, act out. It's going to get worse before it gets better if you're not doing this because it's like putting a dog on a leash that hasn't been on a leash very much. But if you don't let them off and you stay consistent with it, eventually they settle in and do what you want. Um, okay, so when they're on track, when they're doing well, when they're, you're noticing changes, they're taking the trash out without being asked to, or they're, having, they're more respectful to you or their siblings, it's really important you reinforce on-task behavior. I always say when you plant a seed, you don't want to overwater it, you drown it, right? So you overwater it and like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you took the trash out. Like, who are you? Where's my son or daughter? <laughs> that just sets the bar so low for them. <laughs> that they just like, whatever. Okay. So what you want to do with that is simply say, hey, look, I've noticed you've done a lot better job of doing X, whatever it is. And I just want to thank you for stepping up and being more mature. But that's it. No more, no less. All your kids want at this stage in the game is to be more mature. They want to climb the ladder and reap the accolades they get from being higher up on the ladder. So reinforce them with that. 
Now, they're not going to let you know that this really means much to them. They're going to be like, whatever. But inside, they get those little bursts, and that's what we're looking for. It also models for them that their behavior previous, this was the exact opposite of what they're trying to establish and create in their life. Um, you know, it's about maturity for them. And if you deduce a lot of the problems that come in that in my office, it's a maturity issue. They don't want to do homework because it's not fun. They don't want to do chores because it's not fun. They only want to do what's fun. I look at some of the biggest academic drops in kids who are <coughs> anywhere between 6th and ninth grade, and when you break it all down with them, when I finally sift through everything with them, it turns out to be, it's just not fun. I'd rather do what's fun, right? So what we want to do is create a system in your home where you have to work before you play, okay? The kids, I see so many kids today that are stressed, that are overwhelmed, that have anxiety disorders, they're acting out, they're really gravitating to marijuana super quick because it relaxes them, they're just a mess. And it all just comes down to them procrastinating and it turns out to be something that they've been doing for an extremely amount, long amount of time. I mean, if you can enforce a work before play deal, this is how you're going to get your kids to do what you want and need around your home. You know, know nothing until your homework's done now. Your kids come home from school, they haven't had a long day. Okay? They've gone to school. <laughs> They don't need to watch TV, have food, get a foot massage, get a cucumber on their eyes. Oh, the hardest day. You guys have hard days. They don't know what a hard day is like yet. They've gone to school, and they've got 10 times the amount of energy that we do at this age. It's fine to have your kids have some food when they get home, but after that, no TV, no computer, no nothing until your work's done. And then you just sit back and you're the boundary line and you're just enforcing it. That's fine you want to do it right now, but whatever you want, you're not doing anything until this is done. It's your choice, okay? You do, this is the same thing you do with frivolous, random stuff that's around the house, okay? Messes. Moms, I get a lot of moms, and understandably so, they're like, we're going crazy over messes. Leaving the kitchen a mess, wet towel on the floor, just constantly. And they got to ask the kid one time, hey, can you do this? Yeah, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it. Second time, hey, I need to do it. I'll do it, I'll do it. Up. Third time, you're freaking out coming in there. Going, I told you to do it. They're like, why are you yelling at me? And it's, the whole family freaks out, right? So really simple. You just put them on pause at that point, okay? Even if everything's done, you're like, second time around, you just calmly say, hey, look, nothing's happening until our towel's picked up. And here's the key. And whatever you want to do that, it's fine with me, even if it's not. Okay? Because if you start going, this has to be done right here, right now, da 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 you know, unless you're like, someone's laying on the ground and they need to call 911, yes, of course, you can impress upon it, it needs to be done right then and there. But if you start getting into a power struggle with your kid, like, it has to be done right now, you have to do this right now, they know they're the one behind the wheel and you can't control them. So they're going to drag it out a little bit, they're going to use it to stick it to you just because they know you can't really control them. So all you do is you calmly walk up, put your game face on, and go, look, second time around. Everything's on pause. You're not doing anything until that's done. Whatever you want to do that, it's fine with me. I don't care if it's right now, in a day, in a week, but nothing's happening for you until that stupid wet towel is picked up off the floor. And you walk out of the room, and you just enforce it. Um, long and short, if your kids are starting to tell you that you're so annoying, that you're the worst parent in the world, that they hate you, you're probably doing a pretty darn good job of being a parent. <laughs> think about it. I mean, even as an adult, I think the cop, you know, I, I left 40 minutes to get here, and it, and it took me a lot longer than that. It was supposed to be a 20 minute drive. Schools were getting what? Kids were getting to school. I'm flying down the road, and I'm praying to God I don't see a cop to get here this morning. The cop on the side of the, on the road when you're late for something is annoying, right? <laughs> The IRS, every year, to me, is really annoying, right? You, if your kids are telling you this at this stage in the game, you're probably doing a pretty darn good job getting them ready for what's coming. All right, let's talk about substance abuse. Substance abuse, like we said, is pretty happy. Um, you know, you're looking at a beginning experimentation starts anywhere between 7th and ninth grade on a pretty regular and consistent basis. And even if your kid isn't part of that group, they're still hearing about it. Um, 
part of this is it's the older siblings. And if they have older siblings that are hearing about it, the other part is the internet and technology has really gracefully increased the amount of ways we can share information. As much as that's a blessing, it's a curse for the kids at this stage when it comes to these types of things. So they'll go through elementary school, drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, say no to drugs, drugs are bad, you know, bad, 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 bad. It's very taboo for them. As they start hitting seventh grade around there, they start hearing murmurings and utterings of kids that are smoking marijuana or drinking, and they're bad, right? But then they start seeing more kids talk about it and doing it. And as they start seeing the other kids that do it, the ones that aren't the bad kids, the ones that do well in school, that are athletes, it starts to get them desensitized to it. They see it on Instagram, on Facebook, and they start to get desensitized to the, to the taboo-ness of drugs. And then at some point it comes across their radar screen, and gone is all that education and information from elementary school. And we've got this, well, oh, these people are doing it, it's not that big of a deal, they'll do this and I'll try it. So then they try it. I try it a couple of times and a lot of kids like it, right? We're talking about marijuana and alcohol, usually the first, the first things that they start getting into. And then the problem from there is that's how everything becomes a gateway drug. Because then at that point they go, well, they said drugs were bad my whole life growing up. Smoking weed was bad for me, and now this has come across my radar, let's try this. Okay, um, so for some of these kids, it's older siblings they pick it up from. Some of them get it online technology. For some, it's experimentation. They just hear about it, they want to try it. And the other kids, it's an attempt to be cool. You know, they're trying to raise what we call their social stock. You know, they were the cool kids. The party kids still get a lot of recognition from the kids at school as being cool kids. So some of them will do that. And for other ones that aren't socially accepted, your kids are the more anxious, reserved, socially ostracized kids at school. Some of those kids figure out that if I start smoking weed or drinking, I get immediate access into a group of kids, uh, much higher up on the social ladder than I've ever been able to get before. So some of that's simply because of that. As they start in high school, you'll hear on Thursday, Friday, they hear in class or online, you know, about how wasted everybody's going to get, you know. Monday, Tuesday, they're hearing about how wasted everybody got. So it's constantly around your kid, even if your kid's not that kid. Um, so, like we said before, alcohol is really prevalent. Um, you know, it's one of the most commonly abused drugs here in Orange County that I see. Um, everybody's drinking, even the good kids, said the kids, right? Everybody's smoking, even the good kids. Um, you know, I see a lot of kids that are starting to drink, you know, before school, after school, get caught at school. They carry around alcohol in these water bottles, right? And you're so excited that they're hydrating finally. <laughs> <laughs> They've got vodka or gin from somebody's liquor cabinet, and they're passing it around at school. Um, especially the beach. These are for sale at the beach a lot. Um, so on top of that, we've got, you know, it's really hard to keep your kids, I mean, even if you lock your cabinet, you go to other kids' houses, they can raid their other parents' liquor cabinets. They get kids that, you know, even if they have, even, a lot of kids get fake IDs, but even the parents that take the fake IDs, the kids just go find a homeless person sitting outside a liquor store, and they go, hey, we'll give you five bucks if you go buy a bottle of this for us. And this is how they get a lot of their alcohol, from what I'm hearing from them. Um, so the, girl, the boys drink, they drink a lot, everybody's doing shots, guys like to drink beer, girls don't like drinking beer because it makes them fat, so they like hard alcohol. That creates a little bit of a problem. We'll talk about that in a sec. Marijuana is really prevalent. Um, yes, it is more intense than it was back in the day. Um, huge, huge increase in the amount of kids that are experimenting. Um, 18 years now in California, you can legally smoke marijuana and carry a large amount of it in your car with you and be legally okay when you get pulled over. Uh, a lot of kids don't think it's a big deal, they think it's natural. If you have a teenager that's in this mode, he can cite you any and every study on the internet about why this is good and why this is better than anything else. Um, I absolutely believe it is a gateway drug because of what I said previously. We got pills that are really popular, Xanax, Soma, Vicodin, Oxy. Um, they're taking these things in large numbers. I mean, they're not taking the prescribed amount on the bottles, you know, one to two a day. They're taking six to eight at, on a, at a time, trying to get as wasted as possible, which is part of some of the ODs that we see around here. Um, 
it's a lot of kids, it's kind of losing its fat, but they'll do cough medicines, they'll, you know, robo-dose in and stuff like that to take a bunch of cough medicine or the elite cold and sinus that now you have to buy behind the pharmacy and show the government your ID and they scan your ID. It's because the kids are using this to party and they also manufactured that for meth. So, um, cocaine's back, you know, especially for the kids that have money. Uh, cigarette smoking is a lot more PC than it was about five or ten years ago. And we've got now black tar heroin. And, you know, some of the, very few of the kids are shooting up, a lot of the kids will smoke it. You know, just because they're like, I'm not going to mainline something like that, but I'll smoke it. I've been smoking weed for long enough, I'll put this in a pipe and smoke it. Um, let's talk about how it affects your brain. So, really what this breaks down to is brain development, which we know is in their mid-twenties. And on top of that, you know, just to put it in perspective, like it's about dopamine, serotonin, it's about the neuro reinforcement neurotransmitters. And orgasm from sex were released about 150 dopamine units. Drinking alcohol or smoking weed will release about 200 dopamine units. Cocaine will release about 350. And meth will release about 1,250. Okay? So you catch these kids primed at these really, really developmental stages of their life. And for them, hopefully, it's not sex, but it's making out with somebody gives them this feeling, but this gives them this feeling. Well, for their brain, it's, it's a no-brainer which one they want more. And you actually see a change in the brain to go out and seek out these reinforcers, which is part of how this addiction begins. Um, so what's happening is you see a loss of the conventional reinforcers. Once they start caring about this, they don't care about how they look, if their room's clean, what's, you know, how they're doing in school. It's all about this. At 40, here's when it comes to alcohol. 47, this is for all you parents that say, well, well, we did this and it wasn't a big deal. We turned out okay. My response is, is we didn't have the we didn't have the brain imaging studies that we can do now longitudinally with kids. At forty set at, at fourteen years old or younger, when they start partying, they start drinking alcohol on a somewhat regular basis, they have a forty seven percent chance of developing an addiction in their lifetime, regardless of any type of genetic predisposition to addiction. At seventeen years old it's twenty four percent. At twenty years old it's nine percent. I mean these are just because of brain development and how easily the brain is influenced. All the kids, I was, I was clinical director of an inpatient program for substance abuse teens. The majority of kids came in there, started partying before 15. Okay? So the whole name of the game is to really kind of push this as long as you can push this and keep them clean. The longer, longer down the line, the greater they can go out there and be okay. Um, Okay, so a lot the, for the parents that think it's okay to have the kids party in your house, uh, huge legal liabilities, just for, for those of you that don't know. Um, a lot of parents, even if you're having the kids drop their keys, if you're, even if a kid brings alcohol to your home, drinks alcohol in your home, and something happens to that kid, you're liable. So it's a really, really slippery slope. You've got to go between, we want our kids at our home, because we want to know where they are, and we love that they like coming here. We want to be the parents that the kids want to run from. But it's a big legal liability for you, and I'd prefer to be the parents the kids are running away from because they know they can't get away with anything at our house. Um, okay, so here's one of the kickers that comes out of this besides <clears throat> increased depression, anxiety, brain shrinkage, lack of judgment. I mean, they've already got partially developed brains on top of it. Um, and social mistakes. I mean, even as adults, some of the biggest social mistakes you ever made is when you were drinking alcohol. No doubt about it. Right? <laughs> so one of the kickers that comes out of this is, you know, so the girls drink hard alcohol because so they want to get fat, so they'll shoot. They don't do just shots anymore. They'll just pass a handle around or something like that until it's gone. Um, the kids are obviously they're in the middle of puberty. Guys got more testosterone creeping out of their brains now than ever before. This creates a really sticky dynamic when you go to parties or kickbacks or whatever they call them. You know, so we've got really we got what I call opportunists out there, guys that are looking for girls to get a little too wasted so that they can have their way because they don't feel like they can get a girl or that girl any other way. So there's a lot of molestation. There's a lot of rape that I see that comes across my radar. I will never forget the story about a, a girl who was a great, great girl. It wasn't a party, went to a party. So we put some GHB in her drink. This is a you know 16 year old at a party, and she woke up. She passed out, and she woke up in the bedroom of the house, and she saw eyes moving up and down in front of her. 
and she passed back out, woke up, didn't have any clothes on, and she'd been raped by some kid at the party and you know who she was. And every night when she goes to sleep, she see eyes. And she was a virgin on top of it. So this creates a really kind of sticky dynamic, you know, that we gotta look out for. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, a lot of parents don't, they're good at hiding it, okay? They're really good at hiding it. So a lot of parents will sit there and go, well, I smell when they come home, they smell okay, I'll check them out, I have them wake me up when we go to bed. You know, some of the things you want to look for is they come home chewing gum, mints, smelling like cologne or perfume. Some will come in a different change of clothes. So if they've been smoking cigarettes or smoking weed, they'll bring a change of clothes. Say they spilled something on it so they don't come home reeking of smoke that you can smell. Um, they go straight to their room saying, I'm really tired, I just got to go to bed, okay? Or they'll shower. Showers are where most of the people are smoking weed now because their kids all talk to each other and they realize that they're in the shower, they get a break from you, they can lock the door, and on top of that, the heat, the water droplets from the heat help bring the smoke down and drop it rather than spreading it through the house and with the fan on, it's hard to even catch them if they take a long enough shower. Just FYI. <laughs> All right, so everybody breathe. What can you do about this? <laughs> um, I don't really think that the younger kids, especially the younger teens, can moderate this at all. Okay? They don't have a yellow light. You know, you can't send your kid out there. Just be smart. Use it in moderation. They have a red light or a green light, especially when they're younger. Okay? So you're going to have to pick one. Um, to me, it's really about having, especially as they approach, you know, from from middle school all the way up midway through high school, and we'll talk about that in a sec, it's really about having a zero tolerance stance and enforcing it. And the only way you can truly enforce that is with breathalyzing and drug testing. And you buy yourself a breathalyzer, it's really easy, they self-calibrate, you, you get yourself some your home, in-home urine drug test kits, make sure you go in the bathroom with them when you do it, because a lot of them teach each other how to get out of situations, just you know, fill up with water, especially girls, by the way. Even if you're watching, you gotta be careful, because the girls are sitting, they're sitting on the seat, so they've gotta put the cup underneath, so a lot of them will just scoop up some of the water as they're peeing in the cup and hand it to you. So it's, they can throw off the test pretty quickly. So regular but intermittent drug testing. You don't wanna do this every day. It's pain in the butt for you, pain in the butt for them. If you're doing this every night, you come home, you're like, hey, can you pee in this? Can you blow, blow in this? <laughs> you wanna stagger it, okay? You wanna do it intermittently, you know, so they never know when it's gonna hit, which is less stress, more cost effective, and more effective for you. Every once in a while, though, when you're staggering, you do it once, you do it a couple weeks out, you do it a month later, you do it back to back weeks. Every once in a while, though, make sure you do a Friday and a Saturday. Okay, because what a lot of them start thinking is that, you know, it's like hitting the snooze button on the alarm, or I get a little bit of a buffer here so that, you know, I can, get, I, can, I, can, I can do it now and get away with it. So that's why you want to get it back to back at night every once in a while. But this is the way, this way, in, if they say you don't trust me when you're doing this, you tell them, like, this is how you establish trust with us. This is so that we can not micromanage you. This is so that we can let you go within reason where you want to go. We don't have to search your car or go through your backpack or go do these things. It's either going to happen or it's not, you know, it, by doing this, it's going to be positive or negative, and it's a done deal. Um, so design it, propose it to them as a way that's really an added benefit for them. They've got nothing to hide and nothing to be concerned about. It shouldn't be a big deal to, for the payoff of what they get out of it. Um, okay, so on top of that. Again, the goal should be, this. what this does is, this is not going to ensure your kid never smokes weed or never drinks. And to some extent, we'll talk about this in a second, you don't really want that at also. It's about where the balance is. But this is not, it's kind of like your car. You put enough stuff on your car, if someone wants your car bad enough, they're going to get it no matter what. If they want to smoke, if they want to drink, they're going to do it no matter what. You having a system like this is just going to keep a lid on a pot that would normally boil up and over. It's the kids that do this on a regular basis and frequently that really run themselves amok. And this is the most crucial time in life where their grades affect college, which affect job and money and the whole rest of their life. And it's really important to try to keep them as much as possible on their track. Now, let's say you got a great kid, completely responsible, on their game, somewhere around junior, preferably senior year, you gotta stop testing. You gotta start giving them a break. You gotta start letting them go out to places and doing the things they need to do. 
they're in about a year or six months or whenever you start this, going to have carte blanche to do whatever they want. And you're not going to be able to be there to protect them. To some extent, you want to get them through that crucial stage of brain development. But then as they made it through there, start getting them exposed a little bit to some of the stuff and allow them to navigate this on their own so that they can do it at least under your roof. They don't have to ramp up with this whole thing and then unwound when they get to college and have a lot of trouble time keeping their grades up because you've got a you know, second semester freshman coming home from college because they just couldn't handle it. So to me, it's a, it's a slippery slope, but you know your kids. I mean, and let me tell you this much. I have never once in 14 years seen a mother's intuition be wrong. <laughs> Ever. Anytime a mom's feeling something or keying in on something, I'm going right there and I'm highlighting that in my own head because I've never seen a mom's intuition be wrong, ever. So if you're feeling something with your kid, you're right. Don't ever ignore that. Um, okay, so let's talk about other things. So the drug testing gives them an excuse while they're younger to get out of stuff, okay? They can blame it on you. They go, oh, I totally want to smoke that bowl, dude. I'm getting drug tested. My parents suck. You know, you can get this. <laughs> they can roll you under the bus, right? Go for it. You know, I'm, my parents suck. I'm getting breathalyzed. Um, I think that that helps them. You know, what you want to do as they get older, I'm going to save time for questions. As they get older, your kid, depending on their responsibility, they're somewhere in high school, you got to stop calling the parents. Okay, like, is, is a parent home? Is there a party? Is there something going on? Is, you know, and that creates a whole bunch of stuff. Because then your kid's like, no, whose parents call the parents in high school? Like, you're crazy, ah, right? So what you want to do with this, to me, the balance on this, is, look, you have four expectations of your kids if they go out. Look, you tell us where you're going. We don't care if you go to a party. You shouldn't care to some extent. You should care as a parent, but you shouldn't because socially it's a social deal for some of these kids right even if they're not going to drink and they're not going to smoke just the fact that they made it there gives them enough social clout they saw the crazy stuff and for the kids that are on the fence about partying they see the girls drinking and throwing up and stuff like that that can push them the other side to be like oh i don't want anything to do with that but it gives them something to talk about, talk about over the weekend, and make it feel like they arrived, that they made it to there, to that type of a thing. And on Monday, they can still participate in their conversation. So the rule and the balance is, is, look, you can go wherever you want. You want to go to a party? Fine. Parents aren't home? Fine. Here's the deal. You tell us where you're going. You respond to us. Your kids will respond 100% a lot more to a text than to calling them. Don't call your kids, okay? They're not going to pick you up, most of them. They're, gonna go. they're not going to call in front of their friends and be like, when they're trying to keep social stock, I go, yeah, mom, I know, mom, oh, it's so annoying, oh, hi, yeah, okay, bye, mom, yeah, sorry. If you text your kids, especially when they're out, they can still look cool, you know? They can look there and look like they're texting the latest, hottest guy or girl, but they're really saying, yeah, I'll be ready at 11, everything's okay. <laughs> so text your kids when they're out, and you look, all we look for you, you tell us where you're going, don't matter if your parents there, if there's a party there, you tell us where you're going, you respond to us if we text you, you come home on time, you're ready to go on time, and you come home sober. You can fulfill those four things within reason. We're willing to let you do what you want and navigate this on your own. Um, okay. So, so much for, you know, if you're doing this, you don't have to go searching everywhere because you'll know if they're doing something or not. Um, pills are huge. Uh, a lot of parents will lock up their liquor cabinets, but they forget to hide and lock up their pills. Um, you're going to need a lockbox anyways, by the way, if you don't have one or a safe. Because when you start taking their stuff, like their cell phone or their iPad, <laughs> or God forbid, the car keys, they go and find that stuff when you're focused on the other kids or taking another kid to the practice. If you just have a lockbox or a safe that that stuff's locked in, it's a done deal. Okay. Um, so what you want to do is you want to lock up your pills too. Kids are going after anything you got. Friends of friends will come over, go through your cap, say so you have to go to the bathroom, go through your medicine cabinet. One cool thing if you're worried about this, by the way, if you don't want to lock up your pills, is if you just get a bunch of marbles and put them in your guest bathroom where the pills are, like, and just load them in behind the, oh. behind the mirror, <laughs> you're going to know which kid is looking for pills because you'll hear ching and like everything going everywhere all over the floor. <laughs> 
Or maybe you should take your pills out of there and then put the marbles yeah. in just to teach them a lesson not to go through people's cabinets in the first place. But it's really popular. For a lot of kids like partying with pills. You can sell pills. It's a business. Okay, You can sell each pill for at least five bucks. Oxy you can sell for 50 bucks a pill. Okay. So let's see what else we want to talk about here. Sleepovers. I am not a proponent of sleepovers. <laughs> Period. <laughs> If you've got an adolescent, gone are the days of, of play dates, okay? I don't care how much you love the family, how great parents they are, how much it's your kid's best friend, good things do not happen, especially as I hit high school, eighth grade even, when they're sleeping over. Uh, they wake the parents out till two, three, four in the morning. Sneaking out's been a big deal over the past about five years. And like, yeah, people snuck out, but people seriously sneak out now. And it's the internet. They can text. Before, the phone would have to ring, right, at your house to be like, hey, let's meet at this place. Or they'd have to, you know, someone would have to sneak out and get out of their house and come knock on your window or something. They have their cell phones. They just text it. Hey, you up? Let's hang out at the park. Like, I'll meet you out in front of your house in two minutes, right? They're out from two to six, seven.